Welcome. In this short video, I want to cover some of the fundamental differences between Avid Media Composer and Adobe Premiere Pro. There's a lot of stuff that's similar. There's a lot of stuff that is even identical, such as using J, K, and L to move around in a sequence. But there are some fundamental differences that you need to wrap your brain around. And I'm just going to dive in and cover a few of them in this short video. The first thing I want to get you used to is this idea of having freedom to have the media located wherever makes the most sense. Premiere Pro does not have a system of having a centralized media folder like the Avid Media Files folder you typically see with Media Composer. We basically edit footage from wherever it happens to live, whether that's on a hard drive, an internal drive, a network drive, or even a memory card. Yes, it's possible to edit directly off of a memory card. I'm not recommending that for everybody, but some fast uh, run news organizations do use that functionality to be able to very, very quickly pull footage in, get it on a timeline, get a file out the door um, so that a breaking story, they can have the footage as quickly as possible without going through any type of ingest, copy, transcode step. And that's one of the benefits of working inside of Premiere. Now that can be a little overwhelming. So it's something to think about as you're working on a project where you want to store your media and how you want to handle that. If somebody is prepping media for you, you probably don't need to worry about it. It's going to be uh, copied to shared storage someplace, um, and that's that's all there is to it. You can import clips for, directly from that shared storage, and nothing has to get copied. If you're importing clips yourself, just know that Premiere offers a wide range of different ways of importing your media. I can very easily just drag and drop from like a Finder window or a Windows Explorer window uh, if I'm on that platform. I can also use the import screen directly inside of Premiere, and this is now found up at the top of Premiere. And when I click on this import screen, this takes me to a screen where I can see all the different locations on my local computer. I can create favorites by clicking the little star icon that you see up here at the top. Uh, that'll add any location to my favorites list here. Uh, external cards and devices will be found down here at the bottom. Now, you don't necessarily have to edit in place. If you do want to create kind of a central repository for clips, or if you're ingesting from a memory card and you want to make sure that everything is actually copied to a hard drive and you're not cutting directly off the memory card, there are import setting options over on the right hand side. So this means in a case like that, maybe I want to copy media. I can go ahead and turn that functionality on right over here and I can go through and set up exactly where I want this to copy to. In this case, I might say copy the same as the project. Now, just know if you turn this on, that copying is going to happen in the background and you may see Adobe Media Encoder actually fire up on your computer to let you do that process. It'll actually let you start editing direct from the memory card. And as the clips are processed, the clips in your project will just automatically relink to the new location as those copy steps complete. And we use Adobe Media Encoder as a way of kind of monitoring that process to know when that copy is complete and also to do things like MD5 verification so that the, the we verify that the file copied in its entirety over in the other location. Now, I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. I already have these clips on my drive. You'll notice there are some additional options over here, such as uh, putting these in a new bin. So I can call this interviews. And if I wanted to, I could also create a new sequence uh, to string these out so that I have uh, just a sequence and I can kind of organize my footage based on a sequence. There's also some advanced options. Premiere does have built-in transcription. And if you're interested in seeing more of this, you can do a search on some videos on text-based editing. It's a relatively new feature inside of Premiere, uh, one that really lends itself to reality shows, to documentary filmmaking, uh, and it's definitely worth checking out. But this is something I can turn on and it will actually do the transcript of these clips in the background and create a searchable transcript directly inside of Premiere. I'm gonna go ahead and click the import button at this point, and these clips, have already come into my project in this interviews folder and I can see the three clips right here. 
So managing your media, if you do want to kind of have a central repository that if you happen to you know, move things around or if you're working in a shared collaborative environment and you need to make sure everything in your project is on shared storage, make sure and use that copy media function because that'll give you that similar experience to what you're kind of used to of the the NLE managing the location of your media. But if you work in an environment where all that is already put on shared storage, you can turn it off. You don't have to be making copies of your media each time you import something into a new project. Now, the other fundamental difference I want to cover here has to do with what is a Premiere Pro project in relation to coming from Media Composer. One of the key things when you create a new project inside of Media Composer, you typically are probably used to this idea of setting up a frame rate and a raster size or a resolution that you're going to be working in. Premiere Pro is resolution agnostic, it's frame rate agnostic, meaning you can pretty much bring in anything into a Premiere Pro project, but we do manage the frame rate and the resolution on a sequence by sequence basis. When you create a new sequence inside of Premiere, that sequence actually has a frame rate and resolution, and you can find this by selecting the sequence, going up to the sequence, and clicking on Sequence Settings. So currently the sequence I've got open right now is 2997 and it's 3840 by 2160. So it's UHD resolution uh, with a frame rate of 2997. I can actually go in and change that if I need to right here in the sequence settings panel. Uh, that's perfectly fine. And something else to note, in when you look at certain sequences, you may see an editing mode up at the top that says something other than custom. Here's the little secret with Premiere. Premiere kind of has this mindset of trying to guide people working with specific cameras to valid uh, frame rates and resolutions for those cameras. This kind of is a throwback to the early days of HD cameras. There were a lot of different frame rates, resolutions, pixel aspect ratios, and it was confusing to somebody. Hey, I bought a, a P2 DVC Pro HD camera. What is my resolution? I don't even know. Um, so the early days of Premiere, we tried to guide you based on the idea of what camera you were working on. But the key thing is all these different settings, if I set this, for example, to Airy Cinema, that doesn't mean anything is getting transcoded into an Airy format. It just means that the other settings in this sequence settings panel are kind of locked to what frame rates, resolutions, pixel aspect ratios that that particular camera can do. So it's uh, it's kind of an idea of sort of filtering things. If you ever just want to get to the point where you can create your own, you don't have to worry about any of these settings, go ahead and select custom. You might have to scroll up to the very top to select custom. And then you can see the full range of all these different options of what Premiere can do. So. Uh, just keep that in mind. Now you may see that there is a uh, codec and a file format that's listed down at the bottom here. This is only used in cases where you need to preview part of your timeline because you're not getting real-time playback. The way Premiere works is it's always trying to play things back at full resolution, full frame rate, best possible quality for you. Um, but in cases where it can't, you may see some dropped frames. Premiere always gives you the option of rendering chunks of your timeline where you get a green bar over the top. And this preview file format and codec are used to create those preview files. In a way, it's kind of like a, a mini flattening of the timeline. Check out another video that I have that actually covers the idea of using those preview files for faster output later on. But the important thing to note is you can have one project that has a UHD timeline, an HD timeline, maybe a timeline for a social media, you know, vertical video. Yeah, I said it. Uh, you, <laughs> a vertical video uh, sequence as well. Um, so yeah, just keep in mind that as you're working within a sequence, usually you'll standardize on one particular uh, sequence settings uh, for creating a sequence. And I also wanted to point to, if you create a sequence from scratch by clicking on this new item button and going to new sequence, 
you are presented with this kind of crazy list of all these different camera formats, frame rates, resolutions. What I usually like to do is find a preset in here that matches mostly what I'm looking for. So if I'm doing, uh, you know, 1080p 2997, I might come in here and use this Airy uh, preset. If I have any questions on this, I can always click on the settings tab at the top and that should look pretty familiar to you. That's where the sequence settings kind of come from. And at this point, if I wanted to really customize this, I could just select custom, make sure I've got maybe a flavor of ProRes here. Um, and basically I'm, I'm up and, and good to go here. Um, if you do this fairly frequently or you're working on a particular job, you may want to create a custom sequence preset. Those will show up down here in this custom folder. And you can see I have a couple of them listed here that are specific for like audio split delivery and things like that. These are presets that I made. And you can definitely create these presets. Um, if, for, for example, I've seen feature films where instead of cutting at 1920 by 1080, they want a wider aspect ratio. So they'll select and create a sequence preset for editing. That might be something like 1920 by 858. And by doing so, they're seeing in their sequence, in their program monitor, the actual aspect of what the delivery is going to be. And it gives them an easy way of maybe, uh, you know, doing a little bit of repositioning directly inside of Premiere to nudge clips up or down. Um, those are very common things that we see people doing inside of Premiere. It's part of the flexibility of Premiere. So, you know, just keep that in mind. You can always come in if you've selected a preset. Uh, if you've come into settings and made some changes, you can always save that as a preset by clicking on this button down here at the bottom, and then you can give it a name and a description of what the purpose of that preset is, and just use that moving forward. So these are two of the kind of key differences that I wanted to cover in this video. Um, I also want to just mention something called a house codec. Um, because we hear from that a lot. You know, a lot of people are used to working with something like DNX, DNX HD, DNX HR. Um, you're definitely able to work with those codecs inside of Premiere. Uh, you can use DNX OP Atom Media to bring files into Premiere. Premiere doesn't render back out to DNX OP Atom, but it does work with DNX OP1A files and has the ability to import and export in that particular flavor. So that's one way of working with DNX if that's the codec that you prefer. Premiere does use the more modern labeling. We don't put the numbers associated with things. We use the the what what's we the guidance that we got from Avid, which is basically to use things like you know DNX LB for low bandwidth, which is uh, should be similar to DNX 36. So if you're not up on that terminology, that might be one area that you have to just do a little bit of learning, uh, particularly when you're trying to export out one of those formats or you're trying to go through and uh, just understand how those work. Um, for exporting out of Premiere, you can choose between a wide variety of different export options. And I'm just gonna type in the letters DNX here so that you can see we have a couple of different options available here that talk about HQ versus LB versus HQX. You know, again, you're probably more familiar with the numbers associated with these. You can see those target rates uh, in the preset manager listed over on this column here. So I can see like DNX LB, uh, is 36 megabits. Uh, DNX HQX is 220 uh, megabits. So yeah, the, the information is in here. If those are the flavors of DNX you want to work with, you're welcome to do that in Premiere. And with that, I think we're going to wrap up for this session. Thank you so much for watching. And please check out some of the other playlists and some of the other videos that I have on my channel that are also going to be relevant to you as a media composer expert, kind of learning the ropes inside of Adobe Premiere. Thanks again.